Hello everyone! This is Vasilisa Jarikova with another science lecture. Today we will talk about the radio telescope, one of the most significant inventions for exploring the universe. So, how was this technology developed? Karl Jansky, an amateur physicist, was the first to attempt the radio telescope. During the summer of 1930, he was working as a radio engineer at the Bell Telephone Laboratories. The technology of communicating with radios over long distances was very new, and young Jansky was assigned to figure out what natural radio signals can interfere with transatlantic telephone communications. Carl owned an antenna designed to capture those interfering signals by scanning the horizon. It was, it was an unusual looking antenna made from brass tubes mounted on wheels from a Ford T car. The antenna and receiver operated at a low frequency compared to today's standards, around 20 mhz, rotating every 20 minutes. Jansky's apparatus could record data with the help of a pen and moving chart. Additionally, he could listen in headphones. By 1932, Jansky had everything ready, and he recorded many radio signals from thunderstorms both near and far. However, there was something else. A faint but constant radio hiss echoed across the sky every day. His antenna couldn't pinpoint the exact location of the extra signal, but he soon realized that it appeared a little earlier each day. A month later, it shifted two hours earlier. For a while, he thought that this additional signal might be some strange radiation from the sun, but his impressions changed after a partial solar eclipse occurred in New Jersey in August 1932, during which the signals did not disappear. After collecting and analyzing the entire year's data, Carl realized that the signals were coming from a fixed point in space outside the solar system. He discovered radio waves coming from the center of the Milky Way. Six years later, Grote Reber improved Jansky's model by adding a parabolic dish, about 29.5 feet in diameter, and an antenna mounted 26.2 feet above the dish. This gave Reber's antenna a major advantage over Jansky's device. The dish acted as a reflector, directing a narrow, symmetrical beam towards the antenna, providing a much more concentrated and accurate radio readout. In addition, the telescope could be tuned to three different frequencies, 3300 MHz, 900 MHz, and 160 MHz. So, what exactly do we need this device? Why was this technology developed? The radio telescope is a device which enables us to enhance our understanding of the universe. Its, its ability to detect the weakest radio signals gives a big purpose to its existence. Its work procedure goes by the following stages. The antenna of the device collects incoming radio waves. As a matter of fact, the wavelengths of the waves can range from 10 meters to 1 millimeter, about 4 hundredths of an inch. The receiver and amplifier boost the waves to a measurable level. The signal's data is recorded directly onto a computer disk. Astronomers use sophisticated softwares to analyze the recorded data. The data can be in the form of images, for the radio telescope can convert radio waves to pixels. With its ability to record any weak signal from space, astronomers have the opportunity to study the birth and death of stars the formation of galaxies and the various kinds of matter in the universe. By processing the information collected by the telescope and then, to help make sense of strings and of numbers, converting the numbers into pictures, radio astronomers can see the invisible universe. Each number represents information from a specific point in space. Often, they get marked with a certain color corresponding to the amount of info each one of them represents. Astronomers then combine the colors to make a picture, revealing some of the characteristics of objects in the universe. Mind-blowing, right? Now, let us get a little more specific and look at some of the most significant discoveries. Though the Jansky telescope has been developed and used since the 1930s, 
the Arcebo telescope was the main key to most of the findings. The Arcebo was constructed by Professor William E. Gordon between mid-1960 and November 1963, designed to study the Earth's ionosphere. He grew attracted to the sinkholes in the karst regions of Puerto Rico that offered the perfect area for a large dish. The size and accuracy of this telescope exceeded the capabilities of other devices. In 1965, using the Arcebo telescope, Gordon Pittengill discovered the actual rotation rate of Mercury. It had been previously thought that its orbit takes 88 Earth days, however, it appeared to be 59 days, revealing that Mercury rotates three times for every two revolutions around the Sun. Venus's thick atmosphere and clouds, which was once a challenge for astronomers, is no obstacle for the radio telescope. By collecting radio emissions from the planet, researchers are finally able to study Venus's surface features, planet's rotation, atmosphere and temperature, which is now known to be 462 degrees Celsius or 863 degrees Fahrenheit. In simple terms, quasars are massive black holes feeding on gas at the center of a distant galaxy. These appear as stars in a telescope and emit large amounts of energy. Their discovery in 1963 created another statement supporting the Big Bang Theory, yet undermining the steady-state theory of the universe. Since the structure of quasars is very different from the structure of the universe today. First imaging of an asteroid came along the year of 1989. The asteroid passed by Earth within 5.6 million kilometers and got picked up by the Arcebo radar slash radio telescope. By using the detailed time delay and Doppler data from the radio waves, Scott Hudson and Stephen J. Ostro produced a 3D computer model of the dumbbell-shaped Castalia. Now, exploring space with the help of radio telescopes and other devices is far more important than you might think. Many people question this topic, doubting the importance of its purpose. Why can't we just leave the universe be and stay within our Earth limits? If we don't want to one day meet the fate of the dinosaurs, we need to protect ourselves from the threat of being hit by a large asteroid. About once every 10,000 years, a football field-sized stone or iron asteroid can crash into our planet's surface and set off a tsunami, perhaps large enough to flood coastal regions, according to NASA. NASA scientists, in an effort to protect astronauts from losing bone and muscle mass in the microgravity environment of space, helped a pharmaceutical company test Prolia, a drug that could now save older people from osteoporosis. It was, easy, it was easier to test the drug on astronauts, who lose 1.5% of bone mass each month, than on an elderly woman on Earth, who loses 1.5% annually due to osteoporosis. With the help of the radio telescope, we have an accurate image visualizing the beauty of the universe. Movie producers and directors are now able to create many fascinating films about space adventures and terrifying natural disasters, all based on facts recorded by astronomers. So many of the devices, materials and processes originally developed for the space program have found use on Earth. So many that NASA has an office that is looking for ways to repurpose space technology into products. For example, we are all familiar with freeze-dried food, but there, are no, but there are other options. In the 1960s, NASA scientists developed plastic coated with metallic reflective material. When used in a blanket, it reflects 80% of body heat back to its wear, helping the person to stay warm in tough conditions. Even more interesting and valuable is nitinol, a flexible but resilient alloy designed to allow satellites to be expanded after being packed into a rocket. Today, orthodontists equip patients with braces made from this material. All right, my friends, we have come to the end of this presentation. Goodbye, and let us hope that our great knowledge of the space will help us survive another asteroid impact.